thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us on this day and this moment. We have often wondered about your journey, Sadhvi ji. You were a young student when you took Diksha. So how did that happen? There's so much promise in life as a student at Stanford doing your PhD in psychology. And how do you think that the youth who are listening to us today, and there's so many of them, will relate to your decision? So, Ekhtaji, first of all, so touched and so happy to be here with you today. And so, so grateful to be able to come together in a heart connection the beautiful beautiful work the seva that daji and the whole heartfulness community the heartfulness family under daji's blessings and vision is just so extraordinary and so beautiful and keeping the heart at the center really is the core and the key to what we need in the world today. So first of all, just really deep gratitude to you all for this, this beautiful work and my deepest humble pranams to Pooja Daji and I'm so happy to be with you. So as far as, as my journey, you know, it's interesting because, yes, of course, it seems so far out. You've got this white American young woman studying. That also at Stanford, I graduated, then I was doing a PhD in psychology. And yet, as far out as it sounds that someone in that situation would end up taking vows of renunciation on the banks of Ganga. It actually isn't. When you realize that the reason that we do everything in life, whatever age we are, the reason that we do everything is actually because it makes us happy. The core guiding factor in our lives, regardless of who we are, is that state of happiness. Now, of course, for some people, it's happiness on a very, very shallow level. It's happiness rooted in an ice cream cone or a pizza or a night at the party, a little bit of hedonism, a little bit of decadence. For others, it's deeper. For some, it's immediate happiness, even though they know unconsciously that it's going to cause long-term misery you know the nights or days or moments that people engage in things that they think are bringing them happiness in the moment but actually end up making them miserable later on but then you've got people who are able and most of us are at some level to engage in things that maybe we don't love in the moment but we know it's gonna bring us something better later on. This is where so much of our education system comes in, right? How many people really loved trigonometry or you know, loved calculus? For most people, it's, it's a step to a degree, which is a step to a job, a career, a step to an income. But all of that, the end goal of all of that, the end vision of all of that is, then I will be happy. Isko kamane ke baad, isko karidne ke baad, feared finally, kushi milega, shanti milega, anand milega, some sense of self-worth milega. So that is why we do things. And, you know, even when you look at, at Seva, which is so core to how we live, it is selfless in the fact that it's not for 
my pocketbook or my climbing of some kind of career ladder or social ladder. And yet, if we're deeply honest, we realize that that awareness, that experience of living our lives in service actually makes us happy. And I mention all of this because when you look at the choice that I made, I really made the same choice that everybody makes, which is what is it that is the most likely to bring me the most happiness? And what I found in India, what I found on the banks of Mother Ganga, what I found at the feet of my, my Guruji, Puja Swamiji, what I found in seva, in service, was a happiness that was deeper and fuller and richer than any happiness that I had ever experienced in any situation or event or accomplishment. And so for all of my sisters and brothers watching this, be honest with yourself, really ask yourself, what is it? that brings me in my life the greatest, deepest, fullest happiness? Is it really the party? Is it really the shopping trip? Is it really the pizza? Those come and go very, very quickly. And they're also very shallow even in the moment and very tenuous even in the moment. We enjoy the first couple of bites of food. And then mm. actually, the neuronal, neuronal patterns, our whole neural networks, actually shut off. We are primed to newness. And so the first few bites, the taste buds on our tongue are loving it. Our brain is really responding, all of the reward. But after a few bites, the brain pretty much stops responding. It's no longer new, which means that you're not actually getting that happiness that you're trying to tell yourself you are. So really ask yourself, what is it that gives me the greatest happiness? We've seen in so many studies that practices of altruism, of service, of selflessness, of what we would call seva, or karma yoga, actually give much deeper, much fuller, much last, more lasting experiences of happiness than buying things for ourselves, achieving something for ourselves, accomplishing something for ourselves. So I made the same choice that everyone is making. But by God's grace, I made it with a vision and with an opportunity of actually having experienced something that brought so much deep, real happiness, deep, real joy. And that doesn't mean there aren't challenges, of course. Of course there are. But there are challenges in life wherever you go. The challenge is the mind, the challenge is the ego. The challenge is our set patterns of what I want, how I want it, when I want it. Jo me chati, jis the same me chati, jabi me chati, jis se me chati. Those are that which cause conflict in our lives. And so the spiritual practice has been one that for me has not only brought the most happiness, but has freed me from that which caused the most pain, the most suffering. All of that I was holding on to. Grudges, pain, unfulfilled expectations, longing, right? All of that that we are plagued by. Feelings of not being good enough feelings of not being worthy, 
this experience of spirituality, this life of spirituality has brought the real happiness and has freed me from that which steals our happiness. So it's been a, a double, triple, infinite bonus for me. And not only for me, for so, so many I know. So this is, this is the opportunity that you all have to really tune to a path that offers you lasting happiness. And this doesn't mean, by the way, no, doesn't mean that at all. Absolutely. You can have, have a family, get married, have a job, no problem. There is nothing in spirituality that says thou must be celibate, live in a cave. No. The teaching is whatever you do, whether it's the yoga of relationship, the yoga of household or life, <clears throat> the yoga of employment, or the yoga of sannyas, Whatever you choose, just remember, it is yoga, which means that at the core, at the foundation, it is rooted in unity, oneness, union between yourself, that lowercase s self that you identify as, your name, your age, your relationships, your job, your title, your color, your race, your religion, all of that is our lowercase s package, <laughs> at small self. And yoga is the union between that and the capital S self, the divine. So whether it's the yoga of relationship, the yoga of career, the yoga of a householder life, or the yoga of sannyas. In every case, remember, it needs to be rooted in that union between you and the divine. And it needs to be that which is getting you closer to that union of yourself and the divine which of course is measured in what you have so well put as, you know, this joy that you radiate, but also the contentment, you know, the santosha that I feel when I speak to you, you know, your, the very flow, the way you say things, it showcases how you feel. Because I guess when you were explaining Seva, uh, contribution and growth are these fundamental needs of human existence, which bring contentment. And it is so evident. And I'm thankful that you also explained how a grihasta life or a life of a householder or a person who's engaged in society is as good as the one that we have chosen in our lives, for example, when we are brahmacharis or monkhood.